to uh, maybe talk about you know what does it mean to be open source and just defining the basic terms for the conversation. Uh, yeah, so basically open source means that uh, someone can just uh, copy anyone's code, like the code's out there for anyone to review. It's completely permissionless. And so you can really just uh, review it, add to it, or you can even fork it yourself. So basically copy the code and create your own version of it when tweaking some features. So the, the main point of it is that it's permissionless. And not only is the tech out there um, and all the code on GitHub for anyone to look at and review and copy, it also, open source also means legally you do not get in trouble for copying someone's code and taking their IP. So it's essentially just out there as a public contribution to the whole world. So if something is open source, uh, there's no stealing it. Like yeah. it, There's nothing wrong with taking it. It was intentionally put out there for people to be able to use, right? Mm -hmm. um, but as an investor, how do you invest in something that isn't protected? Anyone can go out and take it. Like, does it, is that something that worries you at all? Uh, yeah, I definitely get worried, and that's actually been one of the reasons why I haven't invested in some projects, because um, I don't feel like their token's very defensible or it's rent-seeking, so I stay away from those. Um, but there are scenarios where I actually think teams can really differentiate themselves because they can create a community around their project. So like right now, like Ethereum's completely open source. Like I could take Ethereum and I could just copy it and maybe change it to a different name, but who's actually going to come over and use my platform? Ethereum has that strong branding, has the developers built on the platform, has strong leaders who have really kind of built up that community, really trying to push forward technological innovations. So I do think in, at times it is very defensible because of the, um, the team and community it creates. Um, at the same time, though, I actually, um, at some points, I'm actually okay if there is some rent seeking in the token. I think we've, uh, we've talked about this, yeah. but um, if it's really specialized technology, like something like ZK Snarks, where only a handful of people in the world truly understand it, I, I do think in the current state it's particularly defensible right now because um, people actually trust that specific team to build this technology and um, kind of iterate on it. So at times I actually do invest in things that are rent seeking and open source. But does that remain valuable? Because like at some point, like the technology ossifies, right? Where you know at some point, like you know maybe not zk snarks, but zk starks, and you know we don't have any of the toxic waste, and uh, we'll stay away from the technical stuff. But um, <laughs> Like at some point, like it's kind of done, right? And you know, I, I've heard the story of well, software is like art; it's never actually finished. You just kind of have it ready to ship at some point. But at some point, like it meets all of the feasible requirements for end users, so like it's quote unquote done. So at that point, what if someone goes in there and forks out the the token? Like, can, is that uh, is that just too far away for us to care? Well, I think there's defensibility beyond technical defensibility, and this was some of the things discussed on some of the panels this morning, where you can have um, the best code in the world or the best smart contracts platform, but if you don't have a community around it, if you don't have developers building on top of it, if you don't have the security for miners who are willing to contribute computing power in order to secure this ecosystem, then you don't have very much of a proto like a decentralized protocol at all. So there's other, so as investors, there's other aspects that we look at in addition to just does this code work really well and is this like the best iteration, the most modern development of this particular protocol. Um, and then in addition, I think there's other network effects from um, building up that community that aren't, um, that also, you know, in addition to like developers building um, on top of it and stuff. And so Linda is an advisor to Zero X and I, I think um, Zero Axe has done a good job with promoting this idea of network liquidity amongst um, you know, its relayers and people who exchange tokens within it. And I'm sure you can speak more to it. But basically, even if you fork Zero X, so, which some projects have done, it doesn't necessarily mean you get access to that pool of network liquidity that they've developed. Yeah, interesting enough, I mean, just briefly on Zero X is that um, someone actually tried to fork Zero X and remove the token because they didn't think it was necessary, but then realized they actually didn't have any network effects around them. Mm -hmm. And so they actually ended up joining Zero X, uh, the, the team itself. Interesting. Yeah. So I actually want to push back on that example because um, not only are these things open source, but in that I can copy the code, but they're also permissionless. Mm -hmm. In that if I am one of these developers who goes and forks a Zero X project, for example, like the 0x team can't actually stop me from tapping into their liquidity. 
And so I can go and fork 0x, remove their token, either not have a token or replace it with my own in some weird world, and then also still use the existing network effect, right? Uh, because I can just continue to use the, the liquidity, the order books that are available on the 0x uh, protocol, and no one can stop me. So does that remove the, the argument? Um, it works to a certain extent. Um, I definitely think it's a lot harder to plug into that whole ecosystem if you're like com in a completely isolated environment. Xerox is constantly working with develop developers or actually building on top of them. So they don't have even access to the community and ecosystem around it itself. So yeah, you can have network effects around liquidity, but again, you don't really adopt the community along with it as well. So Xerox to me is particularly valuable. Um, partly because they have all the relayers that are building on top of Xerox. Um, some of them are taking fees in Xerox, some are not. But in the end, like, they're the ones that really have control over this. Not control, but they have access to this community. And that in itself is, part, is very valuable. Yeah. Um, um, so, I mean, like, the, let me give another example of this point, you know, maybe away from Xerox. Uh, earlier today, uh, Vinny talked about Filecoin, and Filecoin is providing a compelling service. You know, you can rent out the excess disk space on your computer. There's some competitors to that that are built on Ethereum that are live already, like storage, right? Um, and so there, like, I, I want to give the same example of, well, I can go and create storage protocol without the storage token, mm -hmm. right? And get paid in ETH, and basically, if someone comes to me to store files, like I actually don't need to build this network of suppliers who are actually providing the service. I can just go and like store it on Storage's network and use that to kickstart my network effect. And basically, I, I can take their entire network effect and I can abstract it and uh, like just sit as a layer of abstraction above Storage and all the other providers and just like find the best place to store it. So I guess like does, that's like the open source nature being a major weakness of these rent seeking tokens where like does a token really need to exist if everyone is happier without the token? But how is the token rent seeking if people are just using it to pay for fees that they'd be paying for with Ethereum anyway? Like if the dollar amount that me as a person who needs to store files is the same whether I use your protocol which doesn't have the storage token or the storage to um, token, then it actually might not even matter to me. So I guess what I'm asking is, even if you take it and fork it, um, I don't see why that might present a significant advantage over me using the storage token. Yeah, I agree. Actually, I don't view rent seeking as uh, actually having a token. I view rent seeking as if there was a token that was taking like two to three percent of fees on the network. So it just creates additional friction on the platform. But uh, when you have something like decentralized exchange in the background that can just frictionally frictionlessly exchange something with one click. I actually don't view that as rent seeking. Um, and I know that some people disagree with that, but. Um. So here's why I would see it as rent seeking, mm -hmm. is if that token in this example, let's say storage or zero X or whatever, actually has some value, then that is the rent that it took from the rest of the economy. Kind of like that value would have been accrued elsewhere. It would have been accrued to, let's say, Ether, Ether in, in this example, mm -hmm. right? So. You, like the issuers of that token did extract some rents by like creating this other thing that has value. Yeah, I, I, I certainly think that's a fair statement, but at the same time, like you do want value to accrue with the team and developers and community that has actually worked on this. So I actually do think that's a very positive thing for the ecosystem as a whole. Plus, and this, this is an argument a lot of teams make, which I, I'm not quite sure I agree with at all in all instances, but with the token itself, you can control the initial distribution of it. So you don't necessarily want um, the users of decentralized file storage to have the same concentration of ownership that Ethereum already has, because you already have some uh, select people that control a large amount of Ethereum. So now you can distribute it selectively to people that want to provide this file storage. So distribution is actually a really big aspect of it, too. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so let's, let's maybe shift gears away from like whether, is it, whether the token is necessary to, let's say you have two teams that are competing on providing the same product, essentially. Um, and let's say they're both you know, using um, crypto and it's all open source. How can someone compete? How can two or three teams compete to provide the same product when everything is open, right? Like, what kind of weird new dynamics does this introduce where, you know, let's say it's the three of us, we're three CEOs of competing uh, organizations providing the same service. 
and I can just like, when I release a new feature, you can literally just copy it. Mm -hmm. and, like tr c completely, you know, just easily in real time. Right, like well, how does that change the whole ecosystem? Yeah, I very well could just copy all the new features that you introduce, but um, as uh, there might other be like other fa factors like tooling around our particular product that aren't necessarily captured by the open source code or the protocol that's um, you know necessarily composes the um, actual protocol token that might be easier for other people to like develop on top of. So if I have better developer tools or if I have a better community engagement or relationships with developers, so there could be value add features built on top of mm -hmm. the actual like open source aspect of what we're doing, even if we're just all copying and ripping each other's features. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, just even thinking about custody, like you could have, create a bunch of different forks of the same chain, but in the end, like, Coinbase custody or BitGo, like, is it going to be supporting all those chains? So there is like this network effect around the infrastructure layer. Um, at the same time, like, people can compete again on community. I think that's one of the biggest aspects of it. Um, and another thing is, as I mentioned, distribution. So let's say we all created the same thing, but uh, you held maybe like 30% of the tokens, whereas I held 40, and it's practically the same thing. Like people can now move towards a, a place that is a little bit more fair on distribution. People directly compete on that feature. Um, I mean, Monero itself forked away from a coin that had this pre-mine of like 80% of the coins, but yet it had really similar features. So people can compete on that. Um, I actually generally think that it's it's a little bit um, it's a little bit oversimplified. Also, that, though, to say that you can like pull features from um, different coins because some some projects need to be built from the ground up to actually be able to integrate some of these features. So, like Bitcoin, like I couldn't just like easily integrate um, zk Starks or something into Bitcoin. So, I do think that some things are better off having just from the start been architected in a way that that feature makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. I. I agree there. I, I guess I completely agree with your, with your point about focus on the community and the, the kind of capture of people's hearts and minds uh, that that presents. Uh, but this presents like a really interesting free rider problem because like now let's go back to that example where you know we're three CEOs providing the same product and so you two are the innovators. You keep on making new tech. I just focus all of my money and energy on go to market. Yeah. And I just keep on copying your stuff, and like I, I build the engineering team with the idea of, you know what? Like I'm just going to copy them. Like mm -hmm. you know, I, I I don't need to e even think about innovating. Yeah. So like, does that present some like terrible like prisoner's dilemma where now like does anyone have an incentive to innovate? So that very well could happen where you could take whatever features we build and with the specific um, purpose of copying them and then focus all of your attention on building the community and getting developers and stuff, which is why when we look at um, protocols from an investment perspective, we're also looking at the distribution channels and how large the end user base might be that a particular like protocol might eventually have access to, which is one of the appeals of the Telegram ICO. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, um, there's a lot of different, I guess, factors to consider beyond just um, taking the code and porting it over um, between different projects. Um, yeah, and I think it also just varies about um, how complicated is the technology. Um, so porting over really complicated features, like people might not even trust that developer to port that correctly even. Um, so yeah, that, that I, I think I can't say like a blanket statement on all of that, but that's certainly a risk when investing and actually, um, I do, I am actually pretty mindful about this when I'm investing in teams because I actually do look for teams that um, are strong technically but also have that ability to do uh, a, a really strong business model and go to market. So um, if they don't have that, um, I'm a little bit wary of it. Um, I think that that's where I could actually add value. But um, some teams, like, they're really strong technically, super academic, but in the end, like, I actually didn't invest because I felt like someone could just copy that and take it uh, to market. Do you, so do you think it sets up a prisoner's dilemma where people in this industry who are core developers will stop innovating or um, sort of be afraid to release features because they're afraid of it being copied? I mean, I can tell you that there's people right now who um, are like, leaving some things closed source mm -hmm. because yes. um, they want to have this crypto business model, quote mm -hmm. unquote, right? They, they want to have this like global permissionless system, but they're not necessarily bought into the open source side because of this fear, right? 
Um, and you know, like actually, we encourage our portfolio companies, please go copy the best features from your, com from your competitors. Like keep an eye on what your competitors are doing and steal, like take it. It's open source, like there's nothing wrong with it. You know, um, one of the examples, actually we, we talked about this recently, I, we, we recently published a piece, you know, Great R is Steel, and we talked about um, EOS, which we've been talking about a lot recently. But you know what, their delegated proof of stake consensus model, like we really like it, it's good. But if something better comes along, and one example would be, you know, potentially threshold relay could be better, like across all dimensions, it could actually just be better at everything, right? Then in that case, should they just steal it? Should they just copy it over and focus on the go-to market only and you know, just think, we don't need to innovate on delegated proof of stake. Like we, and so I, I do think it presents a weird prisoner's dilemma because there will be people like me who will go out to portfolio companies and say, like, no, 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 don't worry about the like, coding part. Uh, just focus on go-to market, focus on your business strategy, let other people like, figure out the hard technical problems and we'll just take it. Um, on your point about closed source and investing in protocols that are potentially behind a certain copyright or a patent, um, are you concerned that that actually uh, goes against the whole ideology of decentralization because now you have one entity controlling the code and there's less accountability for other people to fork it or make it better or for the community to contribute um, at the protocol level? Absolutely. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, I mean, if it's, control, if it's like protected by a patent, it's not decentralized. Yep, right? completely agree. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's full stop, one, one party owns it. Yeah, but there are now protocols, um, there's one, like Hashgraph in particular, that does mm -hmm. follow that model. So do you, like, if other, um, I guess, people who are starting protocols start copying that or going down that route, it, that also might be um, a really bad kind of like ripple effect for the whole industry, because then if everyone starts closing their software platforms or putting it behind um, patents, then we might actually end up getting a less decentralized effect um, than we would have if everything was still open source software. So that's actually why I'm a huge believer in just the ideology of um, crypto protocols being open source to begin with. Yeah, I, I see your point. I think there's two ways to think about it, though. There's, there's so many dimensions of decentralization where, you know, with something like Hashgraph is a great example, right? They, they have um, some closed source stuff. Um, but block production, or the proxy for block production, we won't get into Hashgraph, but uh, is decentralized, right? So like, they, they may be more decentralized in some dimensions and less in others. So is that trade-off sometimes worth it? Like, uh, maybe? Yeah. But I guess if you're a developer choosing to build on a smart contract platform and you have one where you might not be able to do like uh, a proposal like an EIP to ask them to change something or to actually have uh, input into the code in and of itself, there might also be like an overall platform risk the way that like Facebook released um, a platform for developers and then they got to dictate exactly the terms of what developers had access to and how much they get, got paid, et cetera. And then a lot of people might have ended up unhappy um, because of Facebook having that ultimate control. So even for the overall developer environment, I guess I'm kind of worried about um, someone, even if you say that other aspects of Hashgraph might be decentralized. The fact that the core code base, some parts of it are centralized, I'm a little bit worried about that dynamic still. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely really worry about that. Plus, like, Hashgraph itself uh, has, like, a 10% licensing fee to be able to, like, use this technology. I actually don't think Hashgraph is particularly decentralized in, like, any sense, because they even have, like, the 39 block producers mm -hmm. that are set up as a for-profit LLC. So, like, there's just so much centralized points of risk there, and it goes against the, like, the whole reason why decentralized systems should exist, because there's no centralized points of control. Um, so yeah, it's, it's actually a really big red flag to me when I see um, closed source projects. So do you and, think like, open source is necessary for decentralization, or can you be decentralized and not open source? Is that at all possible? I, I actually think that you need to be, I mean, maybe in the early stages, you can be closed source as you continue iterating. But ultimately, if you're launching your network, I, I personally think in order to be fully decentralized, you need to have it be open source um, so that you have a lot of eyes on it. Anyone can contribute to the code. Anyone can take it and fork it. Otherwise, you're at risk of like even, let's say this gets really popular. You have government pressure coming in saying like, shut this down. This is the team that like actually controls this code. So you've now painted this target on your back. Um, mm -hmm. it, to me, there's just too much risk. It might as well just create a centralized application or protocol in that sense. Um, and then also in addition to, um, well, so the core protocol, I believe, should actually be open source in order um, 
for the overall network to be decentralized. But I do think that you can have services um, built on top of the core protocol, like developer tools and other ways to sort of extract rent that are behind a proprietary, maybe like paywall or kind of licensing charge. And in that way, you might still be able to make money and monetize the protocol, even though the base layer itself is open source. And to your 10% point about the light, or 10% licensing fee for Hashgraph, that is rent seeking. Oh, like, yeah, that's that's incredibly, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like we can't fork it or do anything about it. And yeah. um, developers also, if you, um, let's say you commit yourself to using Hashgraph and you sort of tie yourself into that ecosystem, they can arbitrarily choose to raise that licensing fee and you don't have mm -hmm. a choice to escape. Yeah, so I like arguing both sides of this, really. Mm -hmm, yeah. And it's, um, one of the things that I've realized in crypto is, I think we've all seen this, like focusing on this space, is it evolves so quickly. And I spent a lot of time thinking, like, why does this evolve so quickly? Is it just, you know, I'm catching up? Or, and so I'm thinking that everything is changing so quickly? Or, like, what's happening? And the conclusion that I came to is it's because we married this, like, open source ethos. Everyone's always building on the latest and greatest with a capitalist incentive model mm -hmm. to actually do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's been one of the weaknesses of open source before crypto is that there wasn't a real incentive. Like people, people built Linux because they wanted to and like obviously Linux works and like the, it's the highest profile open source project ever, right? So I'm not saying that the capitalist incentive model is like absolutely necessary. We have proof that it's not. But something that I worry about is like does the open source nature like actually end up eating the capitalist incentive model because there are people out there who will go and like just not innovate and free ride and take like uh, take the fruits of the innovation right um, so it, it's it, it's it's like we have this marvelous thing that we built where we like combine these two pieces but it's fragile too and yeah. uh, like there's a lot of like game theory risk of weird incentives that can that can break it yeah I think maybe the end game for something like that happening is if you get a ton of free riders and people like copying code and maybe forking it and um, removing the fees or like basically manipulating uh, the overall ecosystem in a way that the token becomes worthless, then we might even go back to something like we were talking about um, before with like FAT protocols where in the early 90s. Um, we had like not like basically no value at all accrued to the protocol level. That very well could happen in crypto as well. Like we're all because we're investors in the space making the bet that there's something fundamentally valuable about these protocols and about the tokens that we invest in that represent access to that particular network. But we could converge to a day in the future where you're right that all um, the fact that we're, everything is open source means that it might be worth something close to zero or very marginal cost at the end of the day. Yeah, I generally agree with that. Um, I think, though, that a lot of people are still driven by ideologies within the system. It's not just purely incentives. So, like, people in the early days working on Bitcoin, like, I don't think they were as driven by, like, I'm going to just make a bunch of money off Bitcoin. They truly believed in these decentralized systems. So I do think that you'll still have really smart developers and talented developers that are actually working on this because they care and, and what this can do for society. So I don't think it's going to just be, like, no one's working on anything. But generally, I agree, yeah. Yeah, and... Like to, to keep going down that, that, mm -hmm. that line of thought, um, you know, one of the things that I, I thought a lot about is like, okay, so let's say we, we continue down this open source path and everything stays open source. Like, what can't be copied, right? Like, yeah, so we, we talked a little bit earlier about community. Yeah. Um, I had another idea that I want to share is um, trade offs. So uh, we, we obviously had a panel about this a little bit earlier, but um, I'll give an example is um, Ethereum and Let's go with EOS again, because uh, I've been thinking about it a lot. Yeah. Um, so it's on my mind. So like for example, um, EOS has certain features that are useful. Uh, let's say you know protocol level account recovery or human readable names. Like that. Those are cool, they're features. Ethereum can go and implement those same features, mm -hmm. essentially, right? But you know, like the one thing that neither one can really copy from the other is the like the political choices that they've made. Mm -hmm. Where Ethereum is choosing like no, we really value true decentralization of block production because of political and philosophical reasons. And EOS is saying, like, you know, maybe not so much. Like, we don't necessarily need this. So, like, that's one place where they can't really copy each other. 
Yeah. Are there any other such examples that you can think of? I mean, I mean it, it's essentially the trilemma. I mean, like yeah. there's trade-offs on security, decentralization, and scalability. So I think that those are just the team. Like you can't achieve all three, at least in the current state. And so all of these projects are just making trade-offs on it. And so until you get to the point where you can have all three, there you're just going to have to like go with the one that you believe in the uh, the same ideals as them. Yeah. And to your question about are there other things that we can't necessarily copy between protocols, um, I think you were sort of getting at um, like the ideology between the platforms, but there's also brand and leadership. And so brand actually surprisingly really matters a lot in crypto, which is why I think um, there's a lot of contention around like Bitcoin Cash, working from Bitcoin, and the creators of Bitcoin Cash kept insisting this is the real Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they're so invested in insisting that and making sure everyone knows that is because the brand of being known as Bitcoin probably adds um, you know some certain amount of market cap and like dominance over like the next coin that is known as like the the next version of Bitcoin and then also leadership matters a lot too because although Bitcoin doesn't necessarily have a leader now that like Satoshi is no longer in the picture Ethereum has a very visible leader in the form of Vitalik and he's able to actually rally people around him and spend a ton of time like basically building this community and motivating people to care about Ethereum. And so one of the reasons why um, when Ethereum and Ethereum Classic split off, um, so there's par partly it's because of brand because one of the chains was called Ethereum Classic, which made it sound like not the real Ethereum, but also because Vitalik stuck with one chain like very visibly and publicly and said, here's the chain I'm going to continue developing for and advocating for. And then the other branch sort of went off and like maybe a leaderless way or less prominent um, with less prominent leadership. And so I actually think those are two qualitative factors that are really hard to replicate, even if you're copying each other's code. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's like, I would even it, like just go one level of abstraction. It's the story of the mm -hmm. protocol, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, like the leadership and the brand, it, it kind of all ties together. Vitalik mm -hmm. is Ethereum in my mind. Like, I can't really um, separate the two because they're, they're the same story. Um, so yeah, you can't necessarily copy the story, but you can try. Like the, the leadership is like the one part that like just physically can't. Uh, but like maybe with the Bitcoin example that you gave, like they tried and like yeah. they could have it could have worked. Um, yeah, I also th do think that that, uh, so I, I, I completely agree, but I also think that like having that leader is also like another centralized point of failure because that story is so important. So mm -hmm. let's say Vitalik just says, I don't want to work on Ethereum anymore and just decides to like go on vacation. Uh, that's a that's a really big risk mm -hmm. to Ethereum. So I do I do worry a little bit when um, it's, a, it's a project where the, the story is like so meaningful and, and, and is like the primary reason why it's succeeding. So I'm, I'm really worried about that like cult of personality around a specific leader as well. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, I, I do think it is a concern because it's a key man risk in investing in any particular protocol or company. But um, I also think that a very like charismatic visionary leader like Vitalik might add countless billions of dollars of market mm -hmm, value definitely. to the protocol, at least in the moment. So um, it act, that actually might be worth it. Yeah, he's a, Vitalik is such a unique person yeah. though. I, I think that like not a lot of projects could get away with something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, at the end of the day, we have to look at this as investors, right? And mm -hmm. It seems to me that everything being open source adds an element of risk. Just because, like, we don't necessarily know how it plays out. There are all these, like, really interesting attack vectors open up. Um, you know, maybe I go short the coin, fork it out, make a bunch of noise, cover the short, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. the, that could be an extremely profitable strategy. Yeah. Uh, like, all these really interesting attack vectors open up. So, do you feel like... Uh, some of these open source investments that you've made, and I'll speak for myself too, but like, do they have this margin of safety that makes you comfortable with this like risk that um, of these unknown unknowns? Like we just don't, we've never had this type of ecosystem that's all open source before. Uh, I would say much less margin of safety than generally investing in a traditional like tech equity company because of the factors that you name. But I also think that there's such green space ahead of us in terms of like we don't even know like how big this ecosystem will be or how significant this technology might be in 10 or 20 years from now that it's actually worth the risk of all of this going to zero with no margin of safety to um, like put some money into it and all of our careers and time into it right now. Yeah I mean I, I definitely think it's worth the risk uh, again like I really do try to 
um, invest in projects if they're open source where there's a little bit more defensibility around why people would stick to that over the other um, or, or over the fork. So um, I, I feel generally more comfortable, like for example, again, with, to bring up Zcash is because there's such specialized knowledge around ZK snarks that I do feel there's some defensibility at least for the next like five years in that technology. Yeah, it comes down to the time horizon on which you're investing, right? Yeah. Because you know, maybe one day ZK snarks are are good enough, they're done, and then, mm -hmm. yeah. then maybe it doesn't make sense to own any Zcash anymore because I can just port that over to Ethereum, which they've actually publicly committed to. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so uh, I think we're out of time now for the panel part, so any questions from the audience? Yeah, guys, so can you comment a little bit on when you talk about open source, mm -hmm. um, initially in the first presentation, you talk about stable coins, talk about the app infrastructure, Maybe can you comment on how easily would it be to copy or better to wait for something like a stable coin where there's all these different constructs, you don't really know which one and it's pretty binary. Some of these experiments are really risky. So would you rather wait there and then just copy it, whatever is the most successful, and then just focus on go to market? But perhaps in something like D app infrastructure, it, it is good to have all these competitors and, and it's not as easy to fork or copy. So maybe if you can comment on the distinction of how how easy it would be to copy, but make you, maybe the distinction of what you're trying to copy. So I, I want to make a, a point here. I kind of trivialize copying, and I, and I, and I like abstract it away as if it's like some simple like command C, command V type situation, because <laughs> it's not. That being said, um, an example I'll give you is like there was there's a story about like there was literally one engineer at Apple who ported from PowerPC to x86, the Intel chips, right? So like, it's not like it takes, it, this isn't like uh, you know, a go to the moon type project uh, where you need to coordinate thousands of people and spend billions of dollars in order to make it happen. So um, like, I don't think it's trivially easy to copy, but I do think that like, it is economically feasible for sure. Um, so uh, to, to get to kind of the point of your question, like how do you know when it's worth it to just like be a fast follower and copy versus uh, you know to like innovate, um, that's it's hard to say. I I, I lean towards copy. Um, I'm I'm a big fan of people being willing to copy and you know maybe add your own twist to it to give back and everyone kind of like moves together. Uh, but focusing efforts on go to market like that that that's my personal view. Um, yeah, I generally, I'm, I'm okay with the copying concept. Um, as far as like the stable coin example, is that, that's what you talked about. Um, I think that that one's particularly unique because it's so important to have trust in that this will actually work. Because um, if no one believes that the stable coin's actually gonna be stable, it's just gonna death spiral into nothing. Um, so that one particularly like the amount of cash that the team has behind that to like kind of prop up that belief, the amount of relationships they have with like large amounts of capital, the team itself and how competent they are. Um, I actually think a stablecoin example in particular, like people are gonna be less likely to trust just like a completely forked version of it that doesn't really have the capital or relationships backing it. Uh, so I think that one's particularly unique. And then to your question about copying, I actually think that as investors, there might be less risks to us because we can actually spread our bets across multiple different smart contract platforms and sort of hedge out the risk that way. I actually think there's more of a risk to being like maybe a developer in the ecosystem and then spending a lot of time working on something and then having that be copied away. But as investors, it's sort of one of the reasons why um, we can basically diversify our holdings in case there is like a risk of co platforms copying each other. Plus, we can like keep an eye on um, what's being developed in the space. Like, it, it, like you don't just copy something and all of a sudden it br takes all the network effects. You can watch this along the way as the investor. So, um, I think that's really important to just keep a close eye on like what's being forked and like how how much value do they add in that fork. So, lesson learned from last few questions. Wait for the mic. <laughs> Um, I just wondered um, if you talk about open source and the possibility of copying, how do you see private blockchains or private networks as competition for those? So by private, do you mean like just private blockchains or do you mean closed source blockchains? I mean... Uh, like permission chains? I or? mean, for example, like IBM 
copying open source protocol maybe and then offering it to um, their clients to use it. So if the, if like the general, yeah, yeah. If the yeah. general fight is about usability of protocols. Uh, so I'm personally not very excited by these permission blockchains because in the end, like you could have just had a centralized database and created permissions. There's no need to like create this whole like de like this whole um, decentralized system and then only allow certain people to access it. Um, but I certainly think that there is like value to them in that. That's just not what I get excited by. Um, and I think particularly with open source is that you have a, a global community that has eyes on this code that's able to con uh, continually iterate on it and contribute to it. So it's able to scale a lot faster than some of these permission blockchains where you just have like a team at IBM working on it or something. Yeah. And for a permission blockchain, which has taken some maybe of the best features of Ethereum and um, Zcash and et cetera copied it and then IBM props it up and sets it up as a permission um, blockchain that might even attract a completely different set of end users and customers than, a, than an open source um, public blockchain would. So I actually don't necessarily see permission blockchains as directly competitive with public blockchains because the use cases and the end customers might end up being so different that like maybe they wouldn't be stealing each other's market share anyway. Yeah. I I'd like to make an analogy here. It's an imperfect analogy, but uh, it's a good heuristic anyway. It's like the internet versus intranets, right? And so these permission chains are all intranets. And like, if you, if you see any new company start today, like they don't start an intranet. They just connect to the public internet for everything. And you have the appropriate security around connecting to the public internet that, you know what? Like, I'm totally comfortable with having all of our corporate data connected to the public internet because it's secure enough, right? And like, I'm willing to use the public cloud instead of having a private cloud uh, because it, the same, like there are, there are enough security guarantees for it. So uh, like that's, that's my imperfect analogy to these permission chains. I just, like, why, uh, to, to echo Linda's point, like why use a blockchain then if it's gonna be permissioned? It's it really, it baffles me uh, because like a, a regular database is just gonna be way faster, cheaper, and like there's, 10,000 times more people in the world who know how to develop on it. <laughs> and I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say 10,000 times. I have a question. Yeah. Um, can you guys talk about the pros and cons of different rent-seeking models? One being like the Zcash model through inflation, and then the other one being uh, like an equity token that collects fees, and whether one is more liable to get forked out and replaced by something else? Oh, that's a phenomenal question. If you guys want to take first crack at it. Uh, sorry, I, I kind of like couldn't hear very so, well. No, so it, I, it, I was asking about different rent-seeking models, yeah. one being like an equity token that extracts fees from a protocol, yeah. and the other being something along the lines of the Zcash Founders Reward, which does it through inflation, and whether you prefer one model or the other, I think one is more likely to get forked out. Um, I generally prefer the open source model where there's at least some mechanism where the team gets paid out, but not by this like centralized entity because in that equity model you again have this centralized point of risk where there's a team that owns that equity uh, especially if you're working on a privacy coin you're gonna get targeted by the government if you're creating an equity token right you're if let's assume that you do that like proper uh, token issuance model where you only sell to accredited investors that's all very centralized risk to me so I'd rather have it be built into the protocol layer where there's some that are paid out yeah and on the equity token point, I actually do think that um, that is more likely to be copied and for the fees to, um, and to basically be forked and for the fees to either like be taken down or go away completely over time than having a model that has inflation inherently built in. Because um, I think as we were talking about this morning, there are some um, protocols where inflation does serve a pretty important purpose, which is to pay the developers or pay the miners. So that might even be an important like an integral part of the crypto economics of the overall system versus like an equity token that's just taking a fee every time you transact with it. I completely agree. I think, you know, for one other reason is just the visibility, right? If there's a token that is visibly extracting rent and, you know, basically in the form of fee and paying it to some equity holder, then that's very obvious. It's in your face. You kind of like see it and like the, there's going to be a very obvious reason for someone to want to take that away. But then inflation is this hidden tax, right? Uh, that's what central bankers have been relying on for hundreds of years, right? But uh, inflation is this hidden tax, and you know maybe a lot of people like don't even know about the Zcash founders award or how much it is, or because uh, they never notice. They use Zcash, they they might send transactions, and they never feel that pain. 
Um, I also think it's just far easier to do that inflation model and be compliant, um, like uh, the other panelists are saying. So, um, like, because that model kind of relies on the like blockchain being this new thing and these tokens being these new assets that there just aren't regulatory guidelines for. So, like in that case, like is that a security? Like, pretty likely not, right? Because like no one actually bought the thing. Uh, but in the case of like, oh, well, it collects fees and it pays a dividend, then it becomes a lot easier to call that a security. How do you regard uh, patents uh, in, in regard of uh, open source? Because there's two sides to open source. Like there's the licenses and there's the philosophy. And I, I saw like, for example, Hashgraph, for example, uh, is heavily patented. And, and I wonder, like, what do you guys think when you see a project where there's a lot of patents? That, that in your mind, does it prevent? Is it a, a, a roadblock to building a community? I mean, I don't think it's a complete roadblock, but I do think that you're not going to attract the entire community base that you would have otherwise if it had just been completely open source. Um, so it might be harder to attract people for like the ideolog ideologies for joining this. Um, so you might have to like pay developers to come to build on the platform. I, I do think there are situations where um, a, licenses tech a licensed technology like that could exist and actually become quite popular, but I don't think it can like ever get to the scale of something like a completely decentralized network that can't be shut down. In the end, like you have a company that owns that patent. Again, like if you're talking about something like money, store value payments, in the end, like if governments are threatened by this, like they're gonna go after the company that owns that technology that has patented that. They have very clearly shown that they're the ones that control this technology. So it's a roadblock. I, I think that it, it, to a certain scale, it, there will be no roadblock. But I think that once you really try to go after a larger scale, then there is roadblock. So I think it's like different stages. I think there's also another trade-off to consider, which is um, I, this morning we were talking about a DAP has to be perhaps 10x better than like the current centralized version for use, like normal users to switch over. So maybe that's the case with patented software as well. If something that is patented um, has such higher throughput, um, scalability, security, all these like nice trilemma features, like 10x more than the open source protocol that does not extract rents, um, some developers might still be motivated to use it just because it works better. Mm -hmm.